Hi everyone! Today we're going to explore and talk about the mitochondrial electron transport chain, or ETC for short. I'm really excited about this topic because I really enjoyed making all of the diagrams and drawings and I really think I have a great grasp on this cycle. So hopefully you learned something new and I'll try to explain as best as I can. So let's get started. First thing to point out is the site for the ETC and where oxidative phosphorylation takes place and that's the mitochondria. I just wanted to quickly outline the mitochondria structure and you can see here in my drawing that you have the matrix then the inner membrane, which leads to the intermembrane space, and finally the outer membrane of the mitochondria. Here is another close-up of where you have the inner membrane, and then you have the P side, which is high in protons, and then you have the N side, which is negatively charged and is the matrix of the mitochondria. I hope you can picture these diagrams as we move along to the more complicated features of the ETC. So first, what is the ETC? It is a final stage of cellular respiration, and it is the whole reason why our cells need oxygen. So to put things simply, electrons are passed from one molecule to another, and the energy released in these electron transfers is used to form an electrochemical gradient. This is important because as per chemoosmosis, the energy stored in the gradient is used to make ATP, which is what our cells use for energy. And before we get into the steps of the chain, I want to outline a few key players in all of these so that you'll be able to recognize them once we talk about them later on. And of course, because they're part of my drawings and it'll make more sense if you do. So first, we have coenzyme Q, which is also called ubiquinone, which is how I'm going to refer to it in the rest of the video. And it is a membrane-bound carrier and is lipid-soluble. It can accept one electron to form a radical, or if it accepts two electrons, it forms ubiquinol, which is referred to as QH2. So because ubiquinone is both small and hydrophobic, it's totally free to diffuse within the lipid bilayer of the inner mitochondrial membrane, which I showed here, right here, and right there. And it is able to carry both electrons and protons because of this and it plays a central role in coupling electron flow to proton movement, so it's really important. Then we have the iron sulfur clusters, which are prosthetic groups, meaning that they are very tightly bound to their corresponding protein, and all iron sulfur proteins are able to transfer one electron at a time. The iron atom of the cluster can either be oxidized or reduced. These can all be found in complex one, complex two, and complex three of the ETC. So we also have the flavin mononucleotide, or detailed as FMN, and it is a prosthetic group as well, which is found in complex one, and it is a universal electron acceptor, which, is, which in its oxidized form can either accept one or two electrons. This is extremely important and essential in the chain. Lastly, we have heme groups, which are formed are found in complex three and complex four. These heme groups are also found in cytochromes, which are another membrane brown electron carrier. It's not shown here, but it will be on the next slide. So now that you have all the basics down, let's move on to the actual multi-enzyme complexes in the chain. Let's start with complex one. So I'm going to circle here with my highlighter we're talking about complex one first. So this complex is also called NADH dehydrogenase or ubiquinone oxidoreductase. It's huge and it's composed of 45 different polypeptide chains as well as about at least eight iron sulfur centers. Told you that they were key players. So the complex is able to catalyze the transfer of a hydride ion from NAD to the flavin mononucleotide, and this yields NAD+, which can then be regenerated for the TCA cycle. From the flavin mononucleotide, the electron pair moves along the iron sulfur groups. If you follow the red arrows, you can see this, and until it reaches ubiquinone, seen as Q, and it forms ubiquinol, which is QH2, which is seen right here. So ultimately, that's, those are where the electrons will end up. 
So this complex also acts as a proton pump, and four protons are transported to the intermembrane space per one NADH molecule. This is why we have the same downhill flow of electrons and uphill flow of protons. This is the exact mechanism. The exact mechanism for the proton pumping is still unknown, but one day we're bound to find out, right? So next is complex two, which is also called succinate dehydrogenase. Remember succinate dehydrogenase? We saw this enzyme in the TCA cycle, which was the only one to exist within the matrix, and it contributes to this chain because its conversion to fumarate leads to electrons being transferred to FAD. Then through the iron sulfur centers, the electrons are, are moved along, so that's where the electron flow is happening through the red arrows, until they reach ubiquinone, just like in complex one. So this complex is not a proton pump, and due to this, it can't contribute as much to ATP synthesis. This is why around three ATP molecules can be made from NADH, but only two can be made from FADH2. Those are approximate numbers. So now that we're at complex three, I have to emphasize right here, complex three, I have to emphasize that there isn't an order of the first complexes. Complex 2 leads to ubiquinone, and independently, so does complex 1. Now that that's said, let's talk about complex 3. It is also called ubiquinone cytochrome C oxyreductase. Long name, right? So it is a functional unit, and it's made up of dimer and monomer that contain proteins essential for the complex. And in this complex, ubiquinone transfers its electrons to cytochrome C. This complex also acts as a proton pump. And this is where we are first introduced to the Q cycle, which makes up what complex three is all about. And I won't be able to describe it all in detail because this isn't my key term, but essentially it allows for the switch and recycling of ubiquinol and the hemes. So this results in the uptake of two protons from the matrix or the inside and two protons from ubiquinol. So in total, four protons are transported into the intermembrane space per each pair of electrons that reach cytochrome C. You can see that cytochrome C is a soluble pro protein, uh, which I mentioned before, and it's in the intermembrane space over here. And it associates to the P side of the membrane. So once the heme is inside the cytochrome, it accepts an electron and cytochrome C is moved through the complex, uh, the complex four, to donate the electrons to the copper centers in that complex. So the final step in the respiratory chain is complex four, which, which is also called cytochrome oxidase. So here we are at complex four. So it contains two heme groups, plus copper centers. And this is where electrons are carried from cytochrome C to the copper center, to heme groups, and finally to molecular oxygen, producing water. Thus, oxygen is the final acceptor of electrons. This complex also acts as a proton pump. As for every pair of electrons, two protons are used with them to reduce oxygen into one water molecule. Two more protons are then passed into the intermembrane space. This ultimately leads um, to the electrochemical potential gradient that is produced by all the other earlier steps in the chain. So here, let me just erase these. Perfect. And here you can see an overview of all the complexes and how the electrons flow through them, as well as the proton movement into the P side of the membrane. So you can see all of them are put together and you can see that the cytochrome travels to the complex for to, um, to give those electrons. So that's all of them put together. It's quite a sight, right? I think it's beautiful. So I know that this is very long already, but a key part of why the proton movement is so important is because it creates an electrochemical gradient across the membrane, which is ultimately important for the ATP synthase. 
I want you to remember that once protons are in the intermembrane space, they don't want to be there. They really only want to go back to the mitochondria. And the only way to do this is through the membrane spanning protein, which is ATP synthase. Conceptually, ATP synthase is a lot like a wheel. It's F0 part right here, as well as its gamma unit, are the ones that turn in sort of like this binding change mechanism, while its F1 does not, and that's sort of like the knob-like um, description that, um, that we like to give it. And so F0 moves with gamma, and F1 does not. And as it turns, it catalyzes the addition of a phosphate to ADP and turns it into ATP. About three to four protons are needed to make one ATP molecule. So in summary, the energy from the proton gradient is what makes ATP. So that's it. Today, today you learned about the ATC cycle, the last stage in cellular respiration. We went over each step and where it takes place and most importantly, why it takes place and where it leads to. Lastly, I wanna point out that all the drawings in this presentation are modified or redrawn from my Principles of Biochemistry textbook, which is cited here. I hope you enjoyed and thanks for listening.